Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are at the beginning of all of the things that we are going to learn. Obviously, we're going to be dealing with just a review to begin with, uh, some stuff that you hopefully remember from grade 10. Now I know some people's grade 10 experiences were a little shorter than others, and some people had a grade 10 experience that was a little further back in time than others. So I'm going to go through it in detail, and you guys are going to have these videos, and then you guys can look things up as you need to and when you have time. So the first thing we're going to start with is a very simple idea, one that uh, you spent a lot of time with in the grade 10 curriculum, and that is the idea of vectors and scalars. Now, vectors and scalars are just words. They're names. And something you have to understand is that people will invent names, invent words to describe something, so that way they don't have to give every little detail. What do I mean by that? Well, an example here. Normally, if you guys were in class, I would say something to the effect of, how many people here have done any construction or carpentry or anything to do with wood? And I would ask people, okay, if all the people put their hands up, if I were to tell you to go and get me a Phillips screwdriver, could you do it? And a bunch of people would generally say, probably. A bunch of other people would say, huh? Because they don't know what a Phillips screwdriver is. A Phillips screwdriver is the one that when you look at the end, you see an X. This is different from, say, a Robertson screwdriver, which looks like a square when you look at the end. And there you go. You just learned some things about construction. So the reason why these names exist is because it very quickly tells somebody information so long as they know the words. Get me a Phillips screwdriver is a lot faster to say on a construction site than get me a screwdriver that looks like an X. Get me a Robertson is a lot faster than get me a square. Or I should say it's a lot clearer because there are other things on a construction site called a square. Anyway, vectors and scalars are the same thing. They are a name that means something specific in physics. And provided you know what the word means, everything else follows instantly. But if you don't know, it makes things difficult. Now, remember, you guys have all of your notes located online in the drive. So I'll go over them, but I'm not necessarily going to recopy absolutely every component. Because you can just look them up yourself or print them if you'd like. So to review here, right, the first one is going to be a vector. Now, a vector has something very important, and we call that something, in blue here, we're going to call it Magnitude. Now, magnitude is another big, fancy-sounding word. If you were in math class, you may remember magnitude. Magnitude ends up basically meaning a number. So I'm going to put that underneath. This is basically a number. But there is more to a vector than just a magnitude. There is also a direction. And a direction is often given in the form of, you know, like an angle or a direction. Right? It's that way. Or it's that way. That's a direction. So for ease here, I'm going to just put it's an angle. Now, an example of this, oh, let's use another color. An example of this would be a displacement. Now, if you remember what displacement means, calling back to our previous example, you'll immediately know what I'm talking about now that I've mentioned it. If you don't, and you find yourself going, I don't remember what displacement is, don't worry about it, we'll cover it. That's what the review is for. We review all the things. But this is an example, okay? Now, here's an interesting thing about vectors and scalars. They're a binary choice, binary meaning two. There are two options. V, S. So if a vector has magnitude and direction, a scalar will generally be its opposite. That's usually the case of binary choices, left and right, up and down, forward and backwards. Now, it's not 100% opposite just because things can't be super easy for us, but it's pretty close. So a scalar has magnitude. But that's it. 
it doesn't have a direction in any way. So that means that it does have a number, but in terms of which way it's pointing, I don't really care. And distance is the example that we could use for that. Or, if we wanted to use another very important example that I'm sure you guys are all very carefully watching, that could be time. Time is another example. So, vectors, scalars. You've done them before. You've seen them before. And the key thing here is that in grade 10, you spend a lot of time learning about scalars and vectors and figuring out how they work and comparing them and contrasting them and doing all sorts of math with them. Here's the fun thing. After the review, we're basically just going to focus on vectors the entire time. So it's going to make your life a lot easier. But you still kind of need to remember what these things mean, because if I tell you, quickly write out the vector for displacement or the vector for velocity, well, you need to know what that means. You need to know that that means there is a magnitude and a direction. Now again, don't worry if the individual words or terms here are not immediately familiar. That is not a surprise. It's been a while. We review. We'll cover it all. Okay, so as I just said, we're basically just going to be focusing on vectors. We need to know that scalars exist, and occasionally they're going to come up, especially with time. But for the most part, it's vectors all the time. But you guys need to know how to work with vectors. You need to know how vector math works. This is called a vector addition. So, let's review. You guys did some vector addition way back in grade 10, but not all of it. You're going to be learning more of it now. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's start with some fundamental definitions, okay? Vectors can be added if they're in the same dimension. Okay, well, we know what adding means, right? That's the plus sign. Dimension, though. Hmm. Dimension might be a little bit trickier. So, a dimension is usually showcased with a line. I'll write out the definition. I mean, you can see it in your notes, but I'll write it out, and then we'll talk about it. So, a dimension... is a pair of opposite directions. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, well, let's give an example. An example here could be something as incredibly simple as north versus south, or maybe up versus down, left, and right. A ruler such as this, right? I can start off standing in the middle here, and I can go one way, or I can go the other way. There are two directions that I can travel in this dimension. If I put the ruler this way, I can go up, or I can go down. There are two directions for one dimension. Now, the usual way that we write dimension would be to do something like this. You've probably seen this one if you've gone to the movies. If you've ever gone to a 3D movie, 3D stands for dimensions, three dimensions. Well, what happens at a 3D movie, right? You're at the movie, you're watching the screen. Here's our wonderful screen where the physics movie is being played. And in a 3D movie, you will have a three total dimensions. Well, that should be pretty straightforward, right? You've got the left-right dimension, you've got the up-down dimension, and you've got the toward the audience, away from the audience dimension. That's the whole three of the 3D. You've got parts of the film, parts of the movie, that come out towards you from the screen. It's supposed to be a big uh, draw to the audience. 
So 3D stands for three dimensions, and you live in a three-dimensional world, right? Because I'm hoping you're not some kind of paper person that can hang out on walls, in which case that's kind of cool, but unlikely. So you exist in 3D because you can move in three different directions. I can go forward or backward, left or right, up or down. That is three dimensions. And it says here, we can add vectors if they are in the same dimension. Okay, so that's probably super obvious, right? Like if I tell you that something is, a, say, 10 steps uh, forward, and then another 10 steps forward, I can add those two and get my final result. All right? That, that makes sense, because it, it's called vector addition, and they're in the same dimension, they're forwards, right? So I'm, I'm doing this, and then I do this again, and I just add them. Straightforward. This would clearly be 20 steps forward. Notice how I wrote that, right? 20 steps, that's my magnitude in the vector, comma forward, that's my direction. That's the direction I'm going, okay? So that one's pretty straightforward, but I said that I can add vectors if they are in the same dimension. Forward is an option, but so is backward. So I could have 10 steps forward. This will be example two, example one. And I could have 10 steps backward. Ah, what's going to happen there? Now, you could physically do this, right? You could start in a place, move forward a couple steps, move back a couple steps. Where do you end up? Oh, back where you started. So the answer here is not, not going to be 20. It can't be because I don't end up somewhere over there. So what happens? Well, this is where the trick comes in. For north versus south, up versus down, for all directions, for all dimensions, physicists will tend to give one of them a plus sign and one of them a minus sign. Up and north and right tend to be plus. Down and south and left tend to be minus. And that changes this. Forward tends to be plus. Backward is minus. Now, I'm still adding the vectors, right? I'm still putting them together, but the first one is a positive number, and the second one is a negative number, and I hope you guys remember from math class, plus 10, minus 10, you end up with zero steps. Now, I'm hoping this isn't incredibly revolutionary. I mean, maybe the part about dimensions, you're like, oh, I've never heard that before. But I'm hoping that the actual, like, addition component is pretty straightforward, right? We, we just take these things and we put them together, and then we take these two, and we're going to subtract them because they're going in opposite directions, right? They're going like this, down the same length of the dimension. Now, which directions do we make positive? kind of depends. Um, as I kind of hinted here, like north and up and forward are generally positive. Right is positive. South, down, left, backwards, those are negative. So generally we, we set positive the directions that you would kind of assume are positive, right? The sort of standard ones. But if you're ever confused, then feel free to ask. It's no big deal. The other big thing, well, no, I won't go into that yet. So this is the vector addition that you guys did when you guys were in grade 10, okay? And this is, by definition, one-dimensional vector addition because it all involves adding things that are in the same dimension, all along the same line. Doesn't matter which way the line is, right? Could be this way, could be this way, could be this way, doesn't matter. The line stays the same, and everything is on the same line. There's a problem. 
Because what happens if I tell you to go forward and then left? Hmm. Forward and left isn't one dimension anymore. Right? Forward is this way, but left on the floor would be that way. I'd go towards you, towards the screen. Something weird there. This is what you guys did in grade 10. During grade 11 now. Which means we're going to go from one dimension to two dimensions. Ooh. We've doubled the amount of amount of math we have to do. Now, shockingly, this isn't actually going to make things too much more difficult, and we have a series of tools in at our disposal that we can use to solve this problem. Well, let's, uh, let's put this down on the board. Let's get some examples here, give it a try, see what we can come up with, and then we'll see how to do this. So as a bit of an example here, right, I'm going to use a boat. Maybe some of you guys managed to spend some time going canoeing or sailing during the summer. Maybe not, but I'm going to use a boat. So the boat is going to sail north. Ten meters. And then west. Ten meters. Now, two-dimensional vector addition is different from one-dimensional vector addition. There are certain things I can do and certain things I can't do. So for example, I can't just do this. 10 meters plus 10 meters equals 20 meters. Because I don't think anyone is going to assume that if I do a triangle, this side here would be 20 meters because these two are 10 meters. That's not really how it's going to work. And the fact that I've drawn this little triangle here gives you a bit of a hint as to what's coming. Some of you may remember your math class. You may go, wait, wait, triangles, triangles. I kind of remember triangles. Some of them. Now, I can remember this is north and this is west. So north, we said, was positive. Let's use a different color. I had used red. Let's use some red again. We said north was positive, and west, well, it usually goes north, south, east, west. And east is sort of right on a map, and right is generally positive. So west would be negative. So if I put that as positive and that as negative, that would make this zero. And I'm pretty sure everyone can agree that if I walk this way for a bunch, and then I turn and walk this way for a bunch, I don't end up back where I started. So neither of those things work. So herein is where we've got to get a little tricky. We've got to get a little clever. So we're going to draw this. We're going to map this out. We're going to draw this. We're going to map this out. And what we see is... Then we're going to go north 10 meters, right? North. On a piece of paper, we usually say north is up, just for convenience. Then we're going to go west 10 meters. And as we just said, west is generally left. So that's what that looks like when we draw it. It's basically making a triangle. And if I were to ask you where I started, you'd be like, okay, well, you started here. And if I asked you where I ended, you'd say you ended here. So, what is my total movement? Well, what I would do is, I would go from start to end. And that makes me a nice triangle. And not just any triangle. That gives me a right triangle. A triangle where this over here is 90 degrees. 
Now, in math class, when you guys were confronted with triangles, right triangles, what do you do? You have two legs of a right triangle. There's a formula that lets you solve for the missing side, for in this case the hypotenuse, the longest side. What was that formula? How does it work? Can we remember? Hopefully. The formula in question is Pythagoras. Which I may have even spelled with. The Pythagoras equation goes a squared, let's use some colors, a squared and b squared equals c squared. Do we remember this equation? Do we remember seeing this before? I hope so. You guys first learned this in grade ooh, seven, I think it was. So a is, of course, in this case, this one. B is this one, and C will be the green one. Well, let's solve it. You're probably going to need a calculator. Hey, maybe not for this question, but I would definitely encourage that you have a calculator ready whenever we've got a video lesson going, because I'm always going to have something for you guys to try. So 10 squared and 10 squared, because I get to make the example and I made an easy one. We're just starting, guys. Don't, don't go getting crazy yet. There it is. Well, 10 squared, I hope you know, is 100. And 100 equals c squared, which I don't have the answer for. Okay. So I put those two together, and I'm going to get 200 equals c squared. Okay, well, what do I do now? At this stage, we need to know what the opposite of square is, right? I got a square here on this side, and I got to get rid of that square and put it over there. I got to get the c by itself. So the opposite of a square function is a square root function. You're probably going to want your calculator for that one. I mean, maybe some of you can do the square root of 200 in your head. I can't. So if you can, good on you. If you can't, it's calculator time. When you put that in, you're going to get that c is equal to 14.14. Meters, in this case, because I use meters. So there we go. We've got our answer, right? Right? Hmm. It's vector addition. I said something about vectors at the start of the video. I said that vectors are involved with both magnitude and direction. This is a magnitude. We don't have a direction, right? If I just point to you and say, all right, uh, if you want to win the race, you got to go 14.14 meters. Go. You'd be like, go where? I don't, do I go this way? Do I go that way? Do I go that way? Because that one's going to be hard unless there's a rope or stairs. What do I do? So I need a direction in this. Hmm. Well, how am I going to? Find a direction. The green arrow, it's 14.14 meters. So from here to there is 14.14 meters. And yes, the boat went up and over, but I could get from here to there by just following the green line in a straight line. But of course, the problem is I got to tell somebody which way do you walk, right? Like, I'm here, do I go straight like this? Do I, do I go at an angle? Angle. How much of an angle? Well, how do I find the angle of a triangle? Trigonometry. Trying to find the angle down here is going to involve trig. So trigonometry, you guys may remember, involves things like sine, theta, cos theta, 
tan, theta, and then they correspond to things. This one's going to be opposite over hypotenuse. This one here is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, and this one's going to be opposite over adjacent. Well, I basically have every one of those numbers. I can use any equation of my choice. So, whatever, I'm just going to choose one. I'm, I'm going to choose tan, because tan is going to be the easiest. Why is tan the easiest? Well, opposite of my angle is tan. Adjacent to my angle is also tan. Well, that's convenient. It's just one. So, I get tan theta equals one. Well, now i got to get the theta by itself. So that's when I check out my trusty calculator and I hit the inverse tan button. Hopefully you guys remember that. Don't worry, if you don't quite remember it, you can always ask me. I'll show you how to do it. So I put in inverse tan and that's going to give me an angle of 45 degrees. So there we go. Now I'm gonna, we have a direction now. So I could write a final answer. I could say that if I go 14.14 meters comma, 45 degrees, I will arrive at my end point if I start there. Right? Maybe? Something's missing. Did you catch it? Maybe. Maybe not. Which 45 degrees. 45 degrees north, 45 degrees west, 45 degrees south. I don't know which way the 45 degrees goes. I need to figure out a way to say that, to choose. Right? If I'm here looking this way, do I go 45 degrees this way? Do I go 45 degrees this way towards the board? 45 degrees up? What are my options? What do I do? You need to tell them. You need to tell them which way the direction is. Hmm. Well, this is a little bit confusing for people because, unfortunately, English is a terrible language for explaining direction most of the time. Like, case in point, um, right now I could tell you that I am located, say, to the uh, right of this stack of papers here, my notes. Right? I am I am on this side of this thing. I could also say that I am in front of the board. I could say that I am behind the computer that I am filming this on. So the way English does directions is that they compare. They compare where they are to objects or things around them. Right? So right now my hand is under the eraser. My hand is over the eraser, in front of the eraser, behind the eraser. But there's a problem, because when you're dealing with vectors, there isn't always something you can point to. You can't always be like, yes, I'm going to do all my vector addition directly in sight of the CN Tower in Toronto, so I can use that as a reference for everything and be like, yes, I am 45 degrees west of the CN Tower can't do that because I don't always have a big reference in front of me. So what ends up happening is that we end up using a slightly different thing that is always available, no matter what. Unfortunately, that thing is a compass. That's a compass, or a compass rose, depending on how you want to look at it. So, we need to say which direction we're going. And, well, look, compare this to this. We're going 45 degrees west, totally, totally west. But west of what? There are two ways to write this. I'm going to show you them both. I'm going to explain them as best I can. So, the first way is to say, oh, let's use an orange. 45 degrees west of 
north. The other way to do it is north 45 degrees west. Oh, what does that mean? Well, remember what I said. We compare direction based on objects. So when the object is, say, this eraser, and I am, my marker is in front of the eraser, that, that part is easy. Behind the eraser, that part is easy, because there's a thing. I'm no longer going to compare with thing. I'm going to compare to the compass. So I am going to say that I am 45 degrees west of the north line of the compass. So I started off here on the north line of the compass, just like so. And then I'm going to go 45 degrees west of that, like this. And that is what it's trying to tell you. I know this is a little confusing, so I will try it again with, again, the eraser. I start on the eraser, and I say I'm 45 degrees west of the eraser. Okay, well, west is that way. So I will be 45 degrees west of the eraser that I'm using as my example. So if I, of course, remove the eraser and instead replace it with a line, I am now 45 degrees west of the line. If I make that line the north line of the compass, I am 45 degrees west of the north line of the compass. And then we shorten that to we are 45 degrees west of north. I know. I know. English is bad at explaining directions. <laughs> it's just the way it is. English relies on the ability to compare. And when you're comparing to a direction, it sounds weird. Because in our everyday life, we don't really do that. In our everyday life, we compare two things, right? I am in front of this counter. I am under the ceiling. I don't usually compare. I am west of the north direction. That's a little weird. But it's what physicists do because the compass directions are always there. It doesn't matter if we're on Earth or if we're in space or if we're in the center of the planet or zipping around Saturn or anything. The compass is always there. So another way that you can describe this is, if I get a little bit of space here, it tells us in our notes, so you can look at it there as well, of course, but it says that this is sort of starting along the north line, and then we sweep west 45 degrees. Cool. So what's with this? Because this looks completely different. Well, this is actually telling you the same thing. It's telling you in a different way, though. Some of the textbooks will use this. Not that you always use the textbook, but some of them do. So this means that you're going to start north, and then you're going to go 45 degrees. Which way? West. So this is a way to write out the same thing, but this is written in a mathematical way. This is written in a way of English, right? Because again, English, we tend to compare. So west of north, we are in front of the whiteboard. We are under the ceiling, below the ceiling. So west of the north line is how this would be said in English. North is my start, 45 degrees west is my end. So that's just a way to do it in a more mathematical way rather than an English way. So I start by going north, and then from here I sweep west, boom, done. And this angle here has got to be 45. Okay. So, the final answer here, when we say it all at the end, is going to be 14.14 meters, comma, 45 degrees north, oops, west of north. And there it is. That is the final possible answer answer. Took a bit to get there, right? 
adding a second dimension always makes things a little bit more tricky. Obviously, this is going to take some practice. And you will notice in your booklet on page 5 that you have a bunch of practice. You will also notice that page 5 has a curious breakdown in the amount of practice that you have available. Because page 5 has seven questions that are listed as vector addition practice. Some of them are one-dimensional, some of them are two-dimensional. But then it also has, as you can see here in your books, the evil-looking addition sign, because these advanced practice at the bottom, one to six, I'm not going to tell you how to do them yet. You could. Maybe. If you could figure out how. Eventually we'll learn them. Eventually I will show you how to do what I call complex vector practice vector addition. But that'll be later in the unit. Right now, I just want you guys to practice this stuff. Now, I know it looks like a lot, but like break it down, okay? It's Pythagoras, which you learned in grade 7. It's trigonometry, which you learned in grade 7 or 8. And then it's being able to describe things in their direction based on English, which you've learned how to do since you were a tiny child for some of you. Individually, the pieces are not hard. Putting them together is the challenge. So, be careful. And that's all you need to do. You will notice that during the course of me writing this stuff down, I wrote down everything. I will do that even when I'm working on problems. You're going to want to write things down. Keeping organized is very important for what you're doing. If you get off tangent or you get lost, or if you get your numbers crossed, things are going to go badly. So make sure that you keep yourself organized. That's about it. You guys can give these a try on page 5. Later on, we will do some other stuff dealing with some review of different types of vectors and scalars that you guys learned about last year. Um, you'll notice that page 6 of your book has got a bunch of just general algebra practice and mathematical practice. It's optional in case you're feeling that you need a little bit more uh, practice, a little more review. I know it's been a long summer and we forget things. And that's about it. So I will see you guys next time.